This presentation is for information purposes only. It is intended to represent events in general, but not exactly as they occurred on April 5th, 2010, and also to introduce the viewer to the terms and concepts of longwall mining, many of which are used extensively throughout MSHA's accident report. The presentation will provide a broad overview of MSHA's conclusions as to the causes of this tragedy. The events depicted in this animation are being recreated from information gathered during the investigation from various records, interviews, analysis of evidence, and the knowledge and experience of investigators. Many witnesses tragically lost their lives on April 5, 2010. In addition, a number of witnesses exercised their rights under the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and declined to be interviewed. Despite the unavailability of their testimony, MSHA has determined the likely causes of the explosion. At approximately 6.40 a.m. on April 5th, the day shift Longwall crew arrived on the Headgate 1 North Longwall section. They parked their rail-mounted man trip at the outby end of the mule train and walked up the Headgate entries to the face. They found that the third shift maintenance crew had left the shearer parked at about number 34 shield. The crew began producing coal and made their first call out at 7.30 a.m. The crew was responsible to call out their total shift production every 30 minutes. They also called out downtime and the location of the shearer. They reported the long wall was running and had mined .2 passes with no downtime. The shearer was at number 70 shield mining toward the tailgate. At 8 a.m. they reported .6 passes with no downtime. The shearer was at number 140 shield mining toward the tailgate. At 8.30 a.m. the long wall reported .8 passes with no downtime and that the shear was on the tail in the shuffle process. The shuffle is the term used at this mine for the process of cutting back into the coal face on each end of the long wall. At 9 a.m., the long wall reported one pass with no downtime, and that the shearer was at the number 155 shield mining toward the headgate. At 9.30 a.m., the long wall reported 1.4 passes with no downtime, and that the shearer was at number 65 shield, mining toward the headgate. At 10 a.m., the long wall reported 1.8 passes with no downtime, and that the shearer was on the headgate. At 10.30 a.m., the long wall reported two passes with no downtime and that the shear was on the head gate getting ready to replace bits. MSHA believes that after cutting the shuffle, the crew parked the shearer to replace bits. While setting bits, the long wall crew discovered a B-lock, a part of a pin that connects the ranging arm to the shearer, was missing. At 11 a.m., the long wall reported that 25 bits were set in the shearer and that the shearer was down due to a lost B-lock on the tail ranging arm. The crew estimated that they would be down until approximately noon. At 1.30 p.m., they reported that the B-lock was in and they were tightening the bolts. They estimated they would be running at 1.45 p.m. Between 1.30 and 2 p.m., the long wall started running. 
The 2 p.m. report shows 2.2 passes of production for the shift, indicating they had loaded 0.2 passes between 1.30 and 2 p.m. The report also showed 10 minutes of downtime in this period, checking the B-lock. The shearer was at number 65 shield, mining toward the tailgate. The 2.30 p.m. report showed 2.4 passes, two minutes downtime checking the B-lock, and that the shearer was at number 115 shield, mining toward the tailgate. The pre-shift examination record shows that the longwall foreman called out the results of his pre-shift exam at 2.40 p.m. to the oncoming longwall foreman. This is the last known communication from the longwall to the surface. During the investigation of the longwall, methane was found to be emanating from the mine floor near the back of several shields near the tailgate end of the longwall face. Investigators believe the methane migrated from behind the longwall shields. The methane encountered an ignition source, likely hot streaks, left by two dull, worn shearer bits cutting sandstone. Additionally, the water spray system was effectively absent because seven water sprays were missing from the tailgate drum of the shearer. Emsha believes that as the shearer cut into the tailgate entry, a methane ignition occurred and was seen by the shearer operators who shut off the shearer. The electronically recorded event log on the shearer indicated that the tail shearer operator shut off the shearer with his remote control just before 3 p.m. The flame from this ignition continued burning behind the shields. Upon realizing that the ignition could not be controlled, the shear operators, shield man, and longwall utility man evacuated toward the headgate. Investigators believe that these individuals shut off the face conveyor at the control box near the tail end of the face, called the headgate operator, and instructed him to de-energize the shearer. The headgate operator opened the visible disconnect for the shearer cable and also shut off the water to the shearer. During this time, flame from the methane ignition continued burning in the gob behind the shields and those miners continued their evacuation. At about 3.02 p.m., the flames encountered an explosive mixture of methane in the tailgate entry, causing an explosion. This methane explosion involved about 3,000 cubic feet of methane air mixture. The flame from this methane explosion created enough heat and energy to suspend and ignite coal dust from the mine roof, ribs, and floor, resulting in a massive coal dust explosion. Flame from the methane explosion would have traveled about 140 feet before all the available explosive methane was consumed. The methane explosion propagated away from the long wall face. With a flame speed of approximately 300 feet per second, the methane explosion would have extinguished in about a half a second while generating a maximum pressure of about four pounds per square inch of pressure. However, Significant quantities of coal dust were suspended and ignited during the methane explosion. The ignition of coal dust allowed the explosion to eventually propagate throughout all the underground areas affected by the explosion flame. Explosion forces were generated by the flame in all directions, including back across the long wall face. Evidence indicates that approximately 14 pounds per square inch of pressure traveled back to the long wall tailgate from the coal dust explosion. Evidence also indicates that the flame from the coal dust explosion traveled in by in the tailgate entries at about 1,000 feet per second while generating a pressure exceeding 18 pounds per square inch. At the same time, Flame was initially traveling out by in the tailgate entries 
at about 600 feet per second, generating about 6 pounds per square inch of pressure. Several hundred feet before reaching the crossover entries, additional coal dust became involved in the flame, and speeds accelerated to over 1,000 feet per second in all tailgate entries. The flame speed dropped dramatically in the area where the tailgate entries intersect the North Glory mains and eventually extinguished about 11 crosscuts out by the tailgate entries. In the crossover entries, the flame slowed but continued to travel toward the headgate entries of the active long wall, known as Headgate 1 North. Flame propagation did not occur along the length of the North Glory mains, but small pockets of flame extinguished as they projected a short distance into the entries of the North Glory mains. As the flame entered Headgate 1 North, the destructive pressures propagated in by, with a flame speed of about 1,200 feet per second, generating over 20 pounds per square inch of explosion pressure as indicated by the damage to several monorail sections carrying the long wall cables. Although flame did not enter the long wall face, pressures ranging from 7 to 14 pounds per square inch did enter the long wall face from the headgate. Flame and forces did continue in by in the headgate 1 north entries and into the tailgate 22 entries. As the coal dust explosion propagated into tailgate 22, explosion pressures increased to near 20 pounds per square inch due to pressure piling at the faces. The explosion flame turned into the crossover entries and headed toward headgate 22. The flame propagated into headgate 22 at speeds approaching 1500 feet per second, generating a pressure of approximately 25 pounds per square inch. Additional coal dust caused increases in the flame speed and pressure as the flame propagated in by Headgate 22. Calculations have shown that explosion pressures were on the order of 52 to 65 pounds per square inch. Pressure piling occurred as the flame tried to continue in by against the faces. This resulted in a reflected overpressure traveling out by that could have reached a maximum of 105 pounds per square inch. As the flame traveled into Headgate 22, it also propagated into all entries and crosscuts of Gerald's Mains and West Gerald's Mains. Pressures throughout these two areas averaged about 20 pounds per square inch due to flame speeds of over 1,000 feet per second. The flame of the explosion extinguished at the dead end in West Gerald's mains due to a lack of sufficient oxygen for continued propagation.